In case you've been living under a flame trench, last week SpaceX launched the fifth flight of Starship, and did you know they caught the booster? We'll definitely cover that, but there's a lot more to Starbase than just launching and recovering Starship hardware. SpaceX, as usual, is already preparing for the next flight of Starship. There's a whole bunch of new ships and boosters getting stacked, more potential testing on the horizon, and lots of progress on hardware for Pad B. What's up, Star fans? I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase update. Now you probably saw last week's Starbase update was a bit special and different with lots of behind the scenes content, and you should check it out if you haven't done so. Dee did a great job with those BTS videos and edits. So let's catch up on a few things that happened right before Flight 5 that might be of interest. For example, just the week before Flight 5, SpaceX rolled Booster 14 from the Massey Outpost all the way back to Mega Bay 1. This vehicle had been at Massey's to perform its own series of cryo-proof testing, and now that it's back in the Mega Bay, it'll likely receive its engines. Barring any boosters being skipped, or even reused, this should be the booster for Starship's seventh flight, which we expect will be the first flight for the next generation of Starship, which will be, of course, Starship version 2, Starship Block 2, whatever you want to call it. Also at the Massey Outpost back then was Test Tank 16 which was rolled back to the Star Factory, and just this week was moved over to the Rocket Garden, where we expect it'll stay until it gets scrapped. If you remember, this test tank was a test article for the aft section of ship version 2, and was tested inside the structural test stand at Massey's. With testing seemingly completed and an already finished next generation ship, it kind of makes sense to retire it now. All right, now let's talk about Booster 12, which I'm sure y'all were waiting for. Prior to the catch attempt, we could only theorize what SpaceX would do with a landed super heavy booster, so we really had no idea what would happen. One theory was that they would put it on a transport stand, since the launch ring didn't have its guiding pins installed. These pins help to carefully place a booster within the inside of the launch mount, so that the 20 hold down clamps can deploy, grab onto the booster, and not hit it in the process. Of course, the other option was for SpaceX to be SpaceX and brute force the procedure and lower the booster onto the orbital launch mount with no guiding pins. So can you guess what happened? Yep. They brute forced it and put the booster back on the OLM with no guiding pins and didn't even use the chopstick stabilizers. The booster quick disconnect was also extended and connected to booster 12. And although there were no signs of either tanking or detanking, it could have just been connected to provide power and recover data from the vehicle as the QD also has those connections. After a day sitting out on the OLM, teams removed the flight termination system charges from the booster and moved its transport stand to the launch site. That's when the road opened up and Mary, myself, and essentially everybody was able to run down and get a closer look of the first recovered super heavy booster. As you can imagine, first recoveries aren't always beautiful, to say the least. One piece of an aero cover from one of the four chines came off during the booster's entry, so you can see here that it is not in great shape. That being said, the internal structure seems intact, so it might have just been a fluke. Other parts of the booster can also be seen discolored, especially at the top where it got hit by some of the exhaust from hot staging. Also, from a distance, one can see that one side of the booster is a bit darker than the other. We think that might have to do with the booster's flip back maneuver after stage separation. You know, it flips, one side gets hit by the exhaust, and it essentially looks a bit more toasty than the other side. We see a similar thing on Falcon 9 boosters when they do an RTLS. And speaking of Falcon, you may have noticed that there is indeed no soot covering the booster like we see on Falcon 9. Methane burns a lot cleaner than kerosene, so while the booster still gets a bit cooked, it doesn't get covered in that same dirty soot as we're all used to with Falcon 9. This gives the impression as if the booster had never even flown at all, if you don't look too closely at the damaged chine or the discolored forward section. So with everything saved, Booster 12 was removed from the orbital launch mount, and that's also when we were able to get a look at its engines. As we'd seen in some of the SpaceX imagery of the booster's landing, a few of the outer engines had warped nozzles from the heat of re-entry, and that's definitely something that SpaceX will need to take a look at and fix for the next flight. Also, shout out to Raptor 314, or the Pi Raptor, which got to fly and lived to tell the tale. After removal from the orbital launch mount, Booster 12 was then rolled back to the production site and moved inside of Mega Bay 1. Definitely was really cool to see a booster land 
and then so quickly get moved back to the production site for inspections. Surely it's going to be a treasure trove of data for SpaceX, and I for one cannot wait to see what sort of lessons that they learn from their first recovered super heavy booster. Inside of Mega Bay 1 are boosters 13, 14, and 15. So with the addition of booster 12 now also inside, it's getting pretty crowded in there. If SpaceX is indeed successful catching boosters, they may soon run into the same problem they ran into when they started to land Falcon 9 boosters, and they had to pile them up at one of their hangars. Not a bad problem to have. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the other portion of Booster 12 that's missing here, and that is, of course, the hot stage ring. The hot stage ring seems to have impacted the water about 9 kilometers from the beach, and SpaceX looks like they have gone fishing just like they did with Booster 11. This week we saw the same ship they used for Booster 11's fishing expedition, HOS Ridgewind, being sent out to the approximate location of the ring's splashdown on the water. In fact, it was so close to the shore that we could see it from our cameras, seemingly scooping something up using its crane. Unfortunately, it was far away enough and dark enough that it wasn't super clear what exactly they pulled out of the water. Hopefully we'll know sooner or later once the ship returns to the port of Brownsville. So with Booster 12 off the orbital launch mount and back at the production site, you know what's next. Yep, that's right. Work continues on the orbital launch mount. It's a classic, but it's a sign that everything is being once again prepared for another launch. As part of this resumption of work at the launch site, we have seen the orbital launch mount work platform, nicknamed the dance floor, returning back to the orbital launch mount. We've also seen a lot of scaffolding being reinstalled on top of the launch mount, and we've even seen the usual yellow buckets full of scaffolding parts for the inside of the mount. Ironically, SpaceX also reinstalled the alignment pins on the mount, which they didn't use with Booster 12 after it returned. But we can assume that at some point Booster 13 will come here and will need them, so that's at least one thing out of the way. Also at the orbital launch mount, we've seen the now traditional opening of the booster quick disconnect and work going on inside of it, perhaps in order to inspect it after having been blasted during the launch and landing of booster 12. And of course, with the booster gone, teams have been able to resume work on the chopstick arms. These were also relocated to their open maintenance position to properly inspect them and have work done on them. Also with booster 12 out of the arms, we were able to spot the aftermath of that landing on the chopsticks. As you can see, the bumpers got a bit scratched, but other than that, they appear to be good for another catch. Another post-launch tradition is also the waking up of the SpaceX-branded LR-11000 crane at the launch site. This time around, SpaceX also has the CC-8800-1 crane, which it had disassembled prior to launch. Now, with the launch over, the crane is being put together again to support the remaining construction at Pad B. And as you can imagine, work has resumed at Pad B as well. This week, SpaceX rolled two new subcoolers to the launch site, which we think will be for the second pad at Starbase. While the storage tanks will be shared across both pads, SpaceX will likely have a second set of pumps and subcoolers solely dedicated to Pad B. Given that we don't currently expect Pad A to get more subcoolers, these two are probably for Pad B. Rolling along with the subcoolers was also the chopstick cable tray. This tray needs to move up and down along with the carriage, so there are protective plates on the tower that need to be installed to, well, protect this wiring. It is precisely these plates and this cable tray that we've seen being installed on Tower 2 this week, so that's another step in preparing the tower to receive its very own set of chopsticks. Those chopsticks are still sitting at the Sanchez lot, and over the last few weeks they have been receiving reinforcements. We've seen some more of these arriving at the site, and we've also seen scaffolding around the carriage system for Tower 2. This work is probably being done so that both the carriage system and chopsticks for the second tower are all updated to the same standards as the ones for Tower 1. We've also seen SpaceX putting together more pieces of the ship quick disconnect for Tower 2, certainly not slowing down just because they just launched a Starship. Also in the last few weeks, we've seen more parts for the second orbital launch mount arriving on site. We can see that it will still have the traditional 20 hold down clamps as the first orbital launch mount, but it will not feature the umbilicals for the outer 20 Raptor engines. We've now seen work well underway putting these pieces together at the orbital launch mount build area within the Sanchez lot. We'll definitely be keeping track of its progress as time goes on, and it'll be interesting to see all the differences with respect to the first orbital launch mount. Another thing that SpaceX has been doing here at Starbase, specifically before Flight 5, was putting together a fancy mural on the side of the parking garage. So all of that grading we saw that we were scratching our heads about turned out to be 
for a mural. It's a neat thing to have, but come on, SpaceX, you could have at least used a version 3 ship on it. It's already out of date. As with all cosmetic things here in Starbase, it'll just be a matter of time until SpaceX decides it's not worth it and it all gets torn down. Remember the Gateway to Mars sign? Continuing on now to the production site, we can see a lot more progress on the SpaceX office building. The section that joins the building to the Star Factory is also a lot more completed. Just slap some glass on there and the walkway, or whatever it'll be, in between both facilities will be complete. I hope one day, once it's finished, we get a video from SpaceX showing the journey from the office building all the way into Mega Bay 2. It must be super cool. But what's even cooler is seeing new vehicles getting built. This week, SpaceX rolled the common dome section for what we believe to be Booster 16 and the barrel section that goes right underneath it out of the Star Factory. These two were then rolled into Mega Bay for stacking, so that means Booster 16 stacking has officially begun. Booster 16, just like all previous ones, still seems to be of the current version. Version 1, Block 1, whatever you prefer. Just like earlier with Booster 14, we can guess which flight this booster might support if there are no boosters skipped and no boosters reused between now and then. Booster 16 would therefore support Starship's ninth flight. And that kind of sounds far away in time, but we all thought the same thing not that long ago with Booster 12. And here we are. Another vehicle that has seen progress in its build is Ship 34. This is the second vehicle of the next generation of ships. Prior to Flight 5, this ship's nose cone and payload bay stack were both transferred from the Star Factory to Mega Bay 2 for installation of the Pez dispenser. On the first version of ships, this dispenser was installed first on the payload bay section, and then the nose cone would be welded on top of that. However, for version 2, the nose cone and payload section are stacked first, and then the Pez dispenser gets sleeved into the whole stack for installation. This is the process that we think in the future will be done entirely within the Star Factory, but for the moment, it is taking place in multiple steps, both in the high bay and in Mega Bay 2. After the Pez dispenser was installed on Ship 34, we also saw its forward dome section being rolled into Mega Bay 2. That would make three sections being stacked for the ship out of the total seven sections that make up the next version of Starship. Now, in order to carry out all of this stacking, SpaceX uses what we call a four-point lifter. It's essentially a contraption that is attached to the Mega Bay crane to be able to lift version 2 ships without the need for the old and antiquated squid load spreader. And, as its name indicates, it does this by contacting the ship at four points on its hull. This is different from the old two-point lifter that's used with version 1 of ships, which, as you might have guessed, only contacts the ship at two points. Until this week, SpaceX had only built one of these four-point lifters, which meant that if they were stacking Ship 34, they would not be able to lift Ship 33, which is already complete and sitting inside of Mega Bay 2. In fact, during SpaceX's coverage of Flight 5, we got a glimpse of Ship 33 fully built inside of the building. So imagine our surprise when this week we saw SpaceX building a new four-point lifter and getting it inside of Mega Bay 2. I mean, what else would they use that lifter for other than to lift Ship 33? But think about it. What could be the reason for them to lift Ship 33? Well, if it is fully stacked and completed, then maybe it's about time for it to get its own set of cryo-proof testing. This cryo-proof testing normally involves installing the ship onto the thrust simulator stand dedicated for ships. So that would require SpaceX to lift Ship 33 off of its work stand and place it onto that thrust simulator stand before rolling it out to the Massey outpost. So piecing all of this together, it's not outlandish to think that perhaps in the next few days or weeks, we may see Ship 33 rolling from Mega Bay 2 out to the Massey outpost to undergo cryogenic proof testing. I can't wait to finally get to see a fully completed Block 2 ship with all of the differences from version 1. And I know all you Starship nerds out there will be eagerly awaiting the imagery so that you can diagnose all of the things that have changed since the first version of Starship. So now the big question is, when Flight 6? Well, the somewhat good news is that at least the license for Flight 5 covers the flight profile that SpaceX told the FAA they wanted for Flight 6. But the first problem here is that we don't even know what flight profile that was. Given the wording from the FAA, it doesn't seem like it was the exact same as Flight 5, and that changes were proposed but they still fell within the license that was approved. The second problem is that we really don't know whether SpaceX will change their mind and fly some other profile that might not be covered by the current license. In that case, we're gonna have to go through all of the FAA fun again. Uh, so here's hoping 
that doesn't have to happen. Now, one thing that a lot of people wonder is, will SpaceX skip ahead to version two of SHIP? And my answer is, frankly, no. Not only had they already announced SHIP 31 for Flight 6, but also work is still underway to rework its heat shield. This week, we've seen teams continuing to remove tiles and installing the new ablative layer underneath. This work seems to be somewhat different from what they did with SHIP 30, but until it's complete, we won't be able to fully analyze it. We should probably do a video just about that in the future. So SHIP 31 is still being reworked. Pad A is being repaired from Flight 5, then maybe Booster 13 will be able to come to the launch site for some engine testing. That kind of seems like there's at least a good month until many of these items are crossed out. It'll be interesting to see if SpaceX shoots for Flight 6 to be before the end of the year. I think it's entirely possible, but we'll have to see how the next few weeks shape up. But what do you think? Will Flight 6 happen before 2025? Let us know in the comments. All right, that's going to be it for this week. Hopefully we get even more action in the next episode of Starbase Update. But until then, keep watching. And as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.